The MK party has been the talking point of these elections, and they're engaged in a number of different cases. In this episode, we're going to break down what all these different cases are, what they mean, which ones are most important for the election, and what implications they hold for the future. Spread the fire. Welcome back to SMWX, fam. Before we even get started, we are on the road to 100,000 subscribers. Our goal is to get there before the May 29th election. So help us get there by clicking that subscribe button down below. We are racing to 100k and it'll be interesting to see if we can get there by May. Welcome back to SMWX. If you're new around here, I'm Cizu and Paul Walsh. And on this channel, we explore South African politics through interviews and analysis. Okay, so the MK party, the party that former President Jacob Zuma has endorsed and now become the party leader of, has been the big talking point in this election. They seem to be the game changer of this election. And I'm sure you've seen that there have been a number of different court cases happening around the MK party with the ANC, with the IEC. There's now talk of a constitutional court challenge. So I really just want to break down what all these different cases are so that you can get an understanding of what's been happening and also look to the future in terms of the implications of these different cases. So I'm going to break this down into three parts and you can see the cases along three dimensions. The first one is the battle over the registration of the MK party and its ability to be an option in this election at all. And in my view, this is the most important battle and it's one that the MK party has already won. Then in the second part, we're going to look at the second battle. And this is the battle over whether former President Zuma himself is able to go to parliament. And we've already done a video about this, but I'll update you on the latest developments because as you may well know, the IEC has now approached the highest court, the constitutional court, to appeal the decision on this question. And then finally and thirdly, we're going to look at the question around emblems and logos and the trademark and whether Mkondo Esizwe party is allowed to use that name or whether it belongs to the ANC. And that's the third battle. So let's start with part one, which is the battle for the registration of the MK party. So in my view, the most important legal battle that the MK has been involved in is around whether it was even able to contest as a political party in this election. And it turns out this is a battle that it has already won. So in the electoral court, the ANC challenged the IEC's decision to allow the registration of the MK party. And to cut a long story short, the AEC, um, the, A, the AEC, the ANC alleged that the IEC was wrong to accept the registration of the MK party because basically they didn't tick the procedural boxes that were required to be registered as a party. Fact of the matter is that the electoral court looked at that argument and they said, it doesn't really hold. Our job is not to exclude parties unduly and unnecessarily. And the IEC in this instance stood with the MK party to say that it should be allowed to contest. And eventually the electoral court said that was the case. So the MK party is registered. It was formally registered in the appropriate way. And the court, electoral court, which is the court that is designated for these kinds of disputes, has already said it can contest. Now, why is this the most important legal battle? Well, as you've seen in my election analysis, I think that the MK party, if it does contest, which it looks set to do, is going to really shift the tides in this election, and it's going to make the ANC fall quite far below 50, or further below 50, percent of the vote than it would have had the MK not contested. And the simple reason for that is that the MK is eating away at ANC support, especially in KZN. So if they're on the ballot, that's bad news for the ANC. Now, they may eat into EFF support, they may eat into some IFP support, but it seems clear when we infer from the polling data that we've seen that the party that stands to lose the most from MK's contestation is the ANC. So The fact of the matter is that once they're on that ballot and they become an option in this election, as they seem set to become, that completely shifts this election and really sends a big message to the electorate that MK is an option for them to choose. Now, a new part of this question 
has also just emerged because it turns out that in terms of the actual electoral ballot that you are going to get, you're going to get three different ballots in this election for the first time. Why is that? Well, that's because the Constitutional Court told Parliament that they needed to allow independent candidates to stand. Parliament sat down, had to redraw the electoral system, and we are going into the electoral system that they redrew for the first time this election. So those of you who have voted before, you'll remember that you would get two ballots, one for your provincial ballot, so the party you wanted to vote for provincially, and then nationally, the party you wanted to vote for nationally. Now that there are independent candidates involved, you're going to get three ballots. The first two are exactly the same as the old one. So you can vote provincially and you can vote nationally. But then there's a third one, which also counts nationally, which effectively allows you to choose between independent candidates and political parties. So effectively, the big change is that on some ballots, you can now vote for parties or independents, but not both. And we did a whole episode on this, which introduces you to the new ballot system. So I'd invite you to check that out. But basically, the IEC has now decided what the design of the ballots is going to look like. And this is really important for the election. So look at this. The design of the ballot, particularly when it comes to political parties, is that you're going to have the name of the party, you're going to have the logo of the party, and then on the ballot paper, you're going to have the face of the party leader. So let's say it was the ANC. You would have African National Congress, you would have the ANC logo, and then you'd have the face of Cyril Ramaphosa. So that's how the IEC has de uh, decided to design the ballots for this election. Guess what that means for the MK party. It means that former President Jacob Zuma, his face is going to be on the ballot. And we learned this recently from Chief Electoral Officer Sai Mamabolo. So I want you to take a quick look at this clip of what he had to say and how Zuma ended up being not just on the list which is a different question, to go to Parliament, but actually on your electoral ballot. Let's take a look. Now, in respect of MK, um, early last week, we received a noti notification in terms of Regulation 9 to regulations on the registration of parties, indicating that um, Mr. Kumala is no longer the leader of the party. The leader of the party is now Mr. Jacob Zuma. Now, that being the case, um, and in line with the agreed, um, the resolved principles by the Commission on Ballot Design, Mr. Zuma will thus be, uh, the, or rather the photograph of Mr. Zuma will be used uh, on the ballot in respect of the MK party. So as you can see, the MK party was quite strategic here. They realized that the political party leader was going to have their face on the ballot and they quickly changed the leader from their old leader to former president Jacob Zuma, largely because I'm sure they understand that if Zuma's face is on the ballot, that's going to be good for them electorally. So really, quite frankly, all these other cases, although they're quite interesting, are less politically important than this registration one, because once the MK is able to contest as a party and put Jacob Zuma's face on the electoral ballot, that is going to be a big big blow to the ANC in this election, because it means that when people are in that voting booth, whether they're reading the name of the party or looking at whatever logo, they're going to see Cyril Ramaphosa, Jacob Zuma, John Stienhaisen, and they're going to choose often in that way. So this is big news. Zuma is not just con uh, contesting the party, uh, contesting the election with MK. Zuma is actually going to be on the election ballot. Let's come to the second battle uh, in court, which is about whether Zuma himself can go to parliament. And this has been making a lot of headlines recently. So let's dive into it further. Okay, so we did a whole video on the electoral court case involving whether former President Zuma would be on the party list. Just to summarize what this means for you, each party has a list of candidates who, if the party gets enough votes, would go into parliament. That's the way our system works. So the ANC has its own list with Cyril Ramaphosa, etc. The MK party put Jacob Zuma on its list of candidates and submitted that list to the IEC. Then someone objected 
saying he has been convicted of an offense uh, and was sentenced to more than 12 months. And in the constitution, it says that if you're in such a circumstance, you're not allowed to be a member of parliament. So this went to court because MK party said, no, this is unfair. And they won that case. What this effectively meant was that Jacob Zuma could be on the list to go to parliament. And that's where our last video ended. However, in recent times, the IEC has taken the unprecedented step of appealing this directly to the constitutional court on an urgent basis. So let's take a look at what this means. Well, what this means from a legal perspective is that the IEC is going to challenge the order of the electoral court to allow Zuma to be on the list and therefore to go to parliament. Now, there are a number of interesting problems with this, and I'm not so convinced that it's a very wise move on the part of the IEC. I don't think it's a particularly wise move legally yet, but that remains to be seen. But more than that, I think it's an unwise move politically. And it's all well and good to imagine that the IEC simply exists as a legal body. But the fact of the matter is that the IEC is always also going to be a political body when it runs an election. And its integrity is essential, not just to the ruling party, but its appearance of integrity is essential to all parties across the board. So it always has to balance the optics of the decisions that it takes and the political implications of those decisions against, against the legality of its decisions and the hard law. In this case, I don't think it's on solid ground in either case, but let me explain why. Well, let's start with the legal stuff. Um, the IEC has been making this claim that the only reason they're doing this is for legal clarity. Now, there are some problems with this viewpoint. So the fact of the matter is that that's exactly why the electoral court exists. It's where there are disputes. The electoral court exists to provide legal clarity. And at least in its order, if not yet in its reasons, because we don't have the reasons yet, we just have the order. The electoral court did just that. It, it provided clarity to the IEC to say that former President Zuma actually is legally allowed to stand. Now, this could be for any number of reasons. And when we get the reasons of the court, we will um, be able to appreciate the reasons in more detail and in more depth. But the fact of the matter is that we already have clarity and most electoral disputes are resolved through the clarity provided by the electoral court. So it's not clear why there's sufficient clarity in certain cases, but there isn't sufficient clarity in this case when the electoral court has already made a finding. What the IEC really wants is a different outcome because if they were satisfied with the outcome, they wouldn't be seeking this clarity. And I think in many ways the IEC, in this instance, and uh, you know, I'm not casting aspersions over the IEC. The IEC has traditionally been a very strong and still is a very strong institution in our democracy, but that doesn't mean that they can't make mistakes. And I think this is a grave mistake because in this instance, I think they've lost the wood for the trees. And in their attempt to assert their position, they are losing the fact that there are significant political implications to their um, slavish demand to win this legal case, uh, one that they're already on the back foot on having lost at the electoral court. Watch my previous video for exactly why I think that there are sound constitutional reasons why former President Zuma should be allowed to go to parliament. The crux of it from my perspective is that the constitution under section 84 affords extremely wide powers to the president to tamper with punishments that are given by courts. The president has the ability to pardon people. The president has the ability under Section 84J, I think it is, to interfere with any punishment, any punishment, and to remit any sentence or any fine. And when you look at the meaning of the word remit, it can only mean either to reduce or to cancel or to extinguish. So at the end of the day, the constitution allows the president to interfere with and cancel or extinguish or reduce sentences. And this is completely normal. Uh, the principle of the retroactive capacity of a head of state to change forms of punishment instituted by other branches of the government or indeed by courts is a well-established legal principle. 
whether through the act of clemency, mercy, amnesty, or indeed remission or the remittal of sentences. So I, for one, think that there's a very strong argument that the president had the power to reduce former President Zuma's sentence, and that's exactly what he did. But the IEC says they need clarity on this, and so they've gone to the constitutional court. Now, the reason that I think that this is politically unwise for the IEC is that former President Zuma and the MK party have, in many cases wrongly, in my view, put a lot of pressure on the IEC and uh, accused it of bias against the party. And we live in a time when, in a very contested election, the IEC has to show the utmost restraint in not appearing to be biased towards any one party. Now, when the IEC loses a case in the electoral court where they're unanimously found adversely against one party, that already puts them in a difficult position because it, it, it begs the question, why were you so universal in your decision when the electoral court voted against you? So they're already on weak ground in terms of the MK saying you are specifically targeting us. But then they take the additional and extreme step of directly approaching the constitutional court or, or, or at least directly appealing, skipping all these steps. And it can create the perception in the minds of MK followers that the IEC has a special zeal when they are dealing with the MK party. For example, the IEC has lost some other cases and they haven't appealed directly to the constitutional court. Uh, did they not need clarity in those instances? Why didn't they see them as equally urgent? So why has the IEC taken this extreme decision only in this defeat and not in other defeats? These are the kinds of questions that the IEC has opened itself up to. And in my view, a much wiser course would have been to accept and abide by the electoral, well, firstly, to wait for the reasons of the electoral electoral court um, to understand the position it took. And then maybe from there, it could, have, it could have launched into action, but to just abide by the electoral court's decision and focus on the hard work of this election, because the IEC already has its hands full. Now it's going to go into a deeply charged, heated political and legal battle with the MK party right when it's trying to actually administer the election. I think it really should have just uh, had the maturity to avoid all of this, quite frankly, and, and just accepted the electoral court's decision. The fact of the matter is that it's not clear what the big clarity that, that sort here is. I mean, it's how, how often is it that there will be someone whose sentence was remitted by a president who also wants to go to parliament? Um, I don't see that as... as something that needs to be settled right this instant when an electoral court has already settled it for this urgent election in front of us. Um, and it's not clear there would be a very frequent occurrence. It might never happen again, quite frankly. Um, so politically speaking, um, former IEC Commissioner Terry Zelane agrees with me, and I want you to take a look at something that he's said because he also believes that this IEC move quite apart from the legalities of the matter, which are an interesting intellectual and academic debate, one that I'd be happy to have with lots of people. But apart from the uh, legal technicalities and the academic interest, um, from a political perspective, uh, Mr. Zelane also doesn't believe this is the wise thing to do. Let's have a listen to what he had to say. The, the uh, commission is really uh, ill-advised and their position is ill-conceived. Uh, they should not actually be taking this position. And there are many reasons why they should not be taking this position. Firstly, as indicated earlier on, uh, this is not their matter. But secondly, there is a matter that uh, still has to be decided by the uh, electoral court. Even though the electoral court has given an order, they still have to give reasons. And then we don't want to second guess the decision of the electoral court. Perhaps the electoral court will not even talk about the section 47 in their judgment. Mm -hmm, which Why? is one point. 
Pardon yeah, me for interjecting I... there, because if you read their statement carefully, they say they need clarity on Section 47, subsection 1E. So one would think w there could be a myriad of reasons. It could have been the remission of sentence. At this point, we do not know. There's another political dimension to this, and this is the MK will be secretly punching the air at the IEC's decision to go to the Constitutional Court. And let me explain why. If the Constitutional Court decides to hear this matter, and there's absolutely no guarantee that that will happen, to directly appeal to the Constitutional Court is an extraordinary step. The Constitutional Court only hears a minority of the applications brought before it. And so we don't know that they will even um, you know, take the bait on this. But assuming that this actually goes to the Con Court before this election, that will be the most perfect opportunity for the MK party to mobilize around that moment. Can you imagine the rallies? Former President Zuma will take up a podium outside the Constitutional Court and there'll be hundreds if not thousands of people there just on the eve of the election and he'll be able to say that the MK party is being unfairly persecuted and the IEC is spending all these resources going after the MK party, but they don't do so going after other parties or other leaders. This is all part of a big conspiracy to keep former President Zuma out of parliament. And it's just going to give the MK party all the momentum it needs going into this election. Now, for, for the ANC and for other opposition parties, this is bad news because the MK is going to be in the headlines they're going to be on people's TV screens and they will be the talk of this election going into the election. And then the Constitutional Court's going to be under a whole lot of pressure and then they're going to have to come to a decision. And whatever the decision, the MK will be able to exploit that decision politically. If the court rules against them, they'll say, ah, you see, the Constitutional Court that sends Zuma to prison is just doing the same thing again. Zuma can never get a fair hearing at the Con Court. It's always unfair towards him. And that will give them a bounce into the election. Even worse for all of their adversaries and for the IEC, if they win this case, which they also could do, then they'll have a legal victory on top of a political victory going into the election. So I just think whichever way you look at it, I know the IEC won't, won't be thinking about this, and, and I'm not accusing the IEC of helping the MK politically, but just from an objective political viewpoint, this is going to be great news for the MK party into the election. It'll paper over the cracks of any internal disunity and it will unite the party around this court case going forward. So I would certainly look at that going into this election because I think it's going to be a massive moment that could stabilize the MK on, into the 29th of May. Right, so the final set of legal battles is around the MK party and whether it is allowed to use that name and a series of logos and trademarks that the ANC claims belongs to the ANC. Now, we're still awaiting this judgment, which is coming from uh, Peter Maritzburg Court, I believe. And so this case has already been argued. But here's why I think this case is the least important out of the three cases. Let's say, for example, that the court rules that the MK party can't call itself Mkonto Esizo. It has to change its name to Mkonto Esipo or something like that, right? That doesn't have a big influence on the voters, right? It'll just change the name to something relatively similar, possibly, or even not very similar. But as long as Zuma's face is on the ballot, and as long as uh, the party has enough time to tell people about the name change, then in the worst case scenario, all it is is just a different name and a different logo, but the same party, the same voters, the same structures. And so it doesn't seem to me that changing the logo or changing the name of the party would have a big bearing. Maybe it'll take off one or two percent of the vote for those who are confused and are looking for Mkonto Esizwe and they can't find it on the ballot. Um, but I'm sure those people would just see Zuma's face and be like, oh, this must be the party I wanted to vote for. So once again, in terms of the trademark dispute, whichever way that goes, of course, that could go the M way, uh, MK way as well, in which case they'll be allowed to use the name or the logo or both, in which case even better for them. But once again, I don't see this trademark logo thing being a massive game changer in this election. What it would just mean is that MK would need to regroup, think of a different name, think of a different logo, and then go from there. As long as they're on the ballot and Zuma 
is the face of the party, I think that will stand them in good stead electorally. So taking a step back, we have had the MK party burst onto the scene of South African politics. I did a video one day after they announced themselves and I said MK would be a game changer for South African politics. I think that's proven to be the case. We then had a series of rallies that have showed and polls that have showed that the MK is really uh, making a mark on this election. And then we've had a whole series of court cases. And all these court cases have served to do is just strengthen the MK. So I would suggest that the a ANC has shot itself in the foot by trying to deregister the party and trying to remove the trademark because they've just given the MK more headlines, united the party, and you know, redoubled their efforts and their resolve to contest in this election. When in actual fact, if they stepped away and let the MK deal with its own internal issues outside of the headlines, they might have had a tougher time. I mean, we see the MK may be struggling to get some numbers in the Eastern Cape to its rallies. So the extent to which MK will have a fully national footprint is still uh, remains to be seen. But the fact is that they're doing well in KZN, and possibly in Bumalanga and Gauteng as well. And that's all they need to do well in this election. So that's a summary of the key court battles around the MK party in the lead up to this election. And as you can see, even if courts find adversely and find against the MK in the remaining battles, I think there are ways that the MK can get around that. As long as they manage to win the battle to get themselves onto the ballot and into this election, they are set to shift the sands of South African politics come the 29th of May. And then we'll have to see how well they do and how much that influences and affects coalition dynamics. Thanks for watching this analysis of the three different MK cases. Like, share, subscribe. This is the best place to understand and decode what's happening in South African politics. So make sure that you keep it locked on SMWX all the way through to this election and beyond. Help us get to 100,000 subscribers. Like, share, subscribe. Aye, aye, aye.